Good afternoon, folks. Uh, hopefully you can see me here and everything's good. I had a little bit of trouble getting my uh, stream to broadcast to YouTube for whatever reason. I don't really know why, but it looks like I got all squared away in the 11th hour there. Adjust my camera brightness a little bit here. Again, kind of cloudy days here and there, so lighting tends to change about every half hour here, so kind of hard to predict. So let's see here, what was the result of the... Well, it looks like a resounding uh, vote in favor of espresso, which ended up being the right choice. I made some here today. Of course, I did in a full Americano. So. Ah, that's good. Give my phone here. All right, so yeah, I got a little bit of a delayed start here trying to get uh, the camera to work, and uh, again, at the very last second, I, I succeeded. I guess to start off with, we'll, we'll show you what we what we worked on last week, if you were here. Last week on stream, I did the splitting for this piece, and it is uh, it is quite a piece. I have to get this wrapped up and mailed out tomorrow. Uh, this is a fully glazed alligator journal, travel wallet kind of deal there. There's a, a kind of oddly sized notebook that fits over here. Cards, papers, and stuff in here. And again, this is fully glazed alligator. So quite a, quite a task getting this all together and actually making it look proper. But I'm, I'm pretty pleased with the way these uh, scales aligned here in the center. These are all from the lower belly upper sacral region they kind of go across you can see the transition of scales into the flank scales on both sides these actually came all from the same section of hide down there which is why all the scales align a little bit of overlap and a little bit of a little bit of playing with that to get that to look right so they they turned out pretty nice wasn't exactly able to show my edges off in my picture there but give a little quick look there Normally with bifolds and wallets, I could find a place to uh, inside to stick. I have a I have a paper clip that's wrapped up in soft tape that I can drop down in there inside the card so as to keep it pinned shut for photography purposes. But this one here doesn't have anything. It was just too big to really hold in front of the camera, so you'll just have to appreciate it on stream here. Very, very happy with how this one turned out. Happy to be done with it too, because anytime you're working with that kind of that kind of material, it is uh it is worrisome. It is concerning to do just because there is really no room for error. And as I mentioned on the uh, the stream last Monday, the hide that is made from is not mine. It belongs to the customers. So I had to um there really was no going back if anything went wrong. I did have some of my own that I could substitute in, but obviously it would have been a totally different scale pattern, and you know we would have been compromising there. Of course, you have to compensate them for their loss of material, too. So, all sorts of problems in, inherent with that. So, Jeff, I'll show you. I thought I had it sitting right here. I must have... Somewhere. It'd be easier if I can just show you. Here it is. I have... This is just a big paper clip. You can see I just have it wrapped up in tape, nothing too special, but you can drop this down into the uh, card slots of a bifold wallet, and it will hold it shut so you can do the closed closed pictures of it. And it's nice to show the edges off that way because you get the both in the shot there, but again, with that one there, there, there simply was no, no place for it. Pardon me for a second, I'm going to do a little bit of self-promotion here. I'm going to paste the uh, stream link into some discords here. I forgot to do that. All right. Today, uh, as implied by the uh, title of the stream here, I'm working on an ID wallet. I don't make a whole lot of these, but I do get requests from time to time, so another one of them. That's, that's, you're okay, Jeff. It was, I, I intended to show it off anyway, and I couldn't find it right away, but you're all good. Ask away. But um, 
I made one like this a couple weeks ago, and somebody saw it and wanted another one. So this is based, based off of my mid-wallet pattern, so we have our usual card slots over here on the right, a paper slot on the left, and on top of that we have an ID window. And these are very, these are deceptively simple. Uh, this is basically one piece of folded chev, so we get the fully lined effect. Same thing here. Take a piece, fold it, glue it, grease the top, and then using, uh, I have a template that I use to, uh, to guide myself, but then I actually do the corners with my corner punches, and then it's just four straight lines, and you have your, your window cut out. Now, getting the window sized is, is a little tricky, but once you have that figured out, you're good to go. There's a lot of different ways of doing these. I like to do mine without any plastic. I don't like the look of the plastic. Uh, it complicates the construction of everything. It just generally makes everything more difficult. And then if you, you know, if you have bad luck or you bought some plastic that wasn't as well prepared, it'll yellow over time and just, just look nasty. So I find it best to simply dispense with the plastic altogether. And then I get plenty good enough retention just out of this. So consequently, I have wider edges on this. It, it, it obscures a little bit more of the ID than you know, a plastic window would. But I don't have any of, the, any of the concerns about it yellowing or becoming brittle or falling out or having to work around it. It's all handled right here, and I find that easier to work with, and that it looks nicer, too. Ooh, that's still hot. I've got to be careful, the two, two boys are out here. There's one to the left and one to the right of me, and they are just uh, entranced watching the birds out here. If you can, you probably can't hear him chirping, but Dima's over here to my left up in that window just doing little squeaks and chirps and little bird noises. Very cute. But I fully expect him to probably try to run over my desk at some point, so I might be debating if I want to lock them out or give them a chance out here. I think I'll just try to finish my coffee quickly and be all right with that. Anyway, so yesterday I took the liberty of putting all of these together. So I have all of the kind of awkward things done. This is all made. This is all ready to be put into a wallet now. Now we just actually have to make it into a wallet. Uh, and the mid-wallet design is very easy. Probably my most versatile and my most pleasant to make pattern. It's just a very, very good design. We have uh, this inner backing here, and this is actually going to be done on the outside. It's going to be black Batero, so I have a piece of Batero cut already. We need to line the interior of it first, and we're using some uh, kind of stone gray shell for basically the whole construction. I actually ended up getting this on accident from Rocky Mountain Leather. I ordered a different color. I think I ordered taupe, and uh, the, the person working must not have known what taupe was because I got this instead. But as soon as I, I unrolled it, I, even though I knew it was the wrong color, I knew I liked it, so I, I ended up keeping it. And I made a couple really pretty wallets out of it, so it is a, a beautiful, beautiful gray. Very, very glad they sent it to me by accident, because it was just one of those uh, happy mistakes, I guess. Had a good outcome. We're going to cut a piece here for the, uh, uh, like the goat, Drake. <laughs> That's what this is. This is goat skin. No, it is not taupe at all. It's it's very clearly not taupe. The least taupey taupe you've ever seen. There. Should do us. This will be our liner. This will be glued in here. We're going to do that on a 90 degree curve. With Chev, the nice thing about, about this is, number one, it being split so thin, this is only about half a millimeter. Um, in addition to that, it's very textured. 
we don't really have to worry so much about wrinkling or avoiding wrinkles on this because even when we do get a little bit of wrinkling in it, it's not visible. So the nice thing about this is I could take it and glue it on the 90 degree curve. Just the whole surface of it, I don't have to worry about having it floating or anything like that. It just works nicely and it doesn't uh, cause any problems. If this was something thicker or stiffer or with more of a sheen to it, then I'd have to worry about it. But I can just glue it straight to that. Nothing special. The only thing special I'm going to do is gluing it on a curve. That's it. And that accounts for 90% of the issues you might have with that kind of thing. You can see on this piece here, this is my my actual, this is the backing of it here, this piece of black Batero. I've skived three out of the four edges. I leave the top edge unskived at full thickness because we're up here. It's actually the thinnest part of the wall, so I want to leave some extra space there for me to stitch through and have a clean stitch line. We will be doing black stitching against this, which even against the gray will still be visible. I'm going to turn my heater on real quick. Hang on one second. Today is one of those days that is off and on warm and cold. You know, for, you'd be too hot for 10 minutes, so you turn the heat down, and then you're too cold for 10 minutes, and you just kind of go back and forth. Just one of the, one of the things about uh, fall in northeast Ohio. But a good cup of coffee helps. We're having a really, really beautiful fall here so far, which is nice because last year we basically went from summer to winter and had no fall. But the nicest part of the year we were effectively robbed of. Realized I need to get, I'll be right back. I need to get my usual, have my paper towel from yesterday. Anytime I'm gluing or, or painting or things like that, I try to keep a damp paper towel handy, so I'll be right back. I'm going to go get a fresh paper towel here. That way, in case we get any, any glue spills or things like that, we can just wipe it up immediately. I'll be right back. Okay, all discombobulated today. Wow, low 80s still, that's gnarly. Low 80s is nice though, as long as it's not too humid. Today's actually gonna be relatively warm. I think we're getting up to uh, 68 here today. Speaking of Ohio, I have a complaint to register uh, with one uh, company known as Netflix. So if you have Netflix, you've probably seen on the front page uh, the, the Devil in Ohio show. And so I saw that and was like, oh, well, I'm, I'm from that place. Maybe this show will be interesting to me. And I looked at it and was like, oh, yeah, a good cult investigation show is what it's billed as. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, this, this should be good. It was terrible. I, I went through half an hour of it, and I don't know. Nothing happened. Nothing grabbed me in, in, in the first the first pilot episode, you know, like, come on. And it was just, literally within the first 10 minutes, there's a mention of Ohio State University, the Cleveland Browns, the Pittsburgh Steelers. And let me be clear, I have never heard the Cleveland Browns mentioned in media, ever. So I was like, oh, okay, this is this is pandering. This is just, this is pandering too much. So I, was in, I was admittedly turned off from it for that, so I have somewhat of a biased opinion being uh, the devil in Ohio. But... Uh, if you watched it, what did you think of it? Am I, am I wrong? Should I give it another chance? Or am, am I missing out on something? Like, help me out here. Yeah, I was just not impressed. It did not, uh, it did not grab me. So, inst so instead of that, we, we couldn't even finish the first episode. Instead of that, we watched uh, an episode of Sharps Rifles. Which is something I've been meaning to watch for a long time and never have. I finally got around to watching some of it last night. That, of course, is the uh, the excellent Sean Bean series with him playing you know, a, a rifleman during the Napoleonic Wars and the Peninsular Campaign. And uh, really, really excellent. Excellent TV, that is. 
I'm getting my glue on here and I kind of have to, this is kind of two steps forward, one step back with this, because by the time I get to the other end, the leather has started to kind of soak up the glue and I'm losing some of my bond on it. So I have to, I have to work quickly and I have to go back over areas I've already put glue down to keep it, uh, keep it activated here. I think we should be just about ready there. That should do it. Now we're going to lay this on here flat, but we're not going to, we're just going to tack it down there just to hold it. I'm not going to press it down just yet, but I'm going to get my form. So now just tacking it down in the center, that kind of held it in place long enough for me to get it onto the form. Begin working it down here. I'm just taking my thumbs and working from the inside out in all the directions, trying to get that glue to set in there, and this will dry on a 90 degree curve. I think I have that mostly down. Let me check my glass slicker, make sure it's clean. It is. Put a little more pressure on it here. Take that off. There we go. Now, with using so much glue, you probably noticed I got a little bit of glue on the outside. Not to worry, this being water-based glue. Just redampen it a little bit, hit it with a brush, and we're good to go. The rest of that will come off with the actual final polishing. Oh yeah, you guys have much more of a fire concern than we do, that's true. We we very rarely get anything like that out here. Almost almost never. We're usually usually quite damp. That's good coffee. So we have this ready. Let's go ahead and I'm just gonna go around and double check all my edges, make sure I got glue out to them. On there, I could use a little bit more glue, but I suspect that'll probably get trimmed away in the end anyway. This was a particularly dry piece of Batero. I don't normally have to fight it this much. This one here, just for whatever reason, really, really aggressively soaked up the, uh, the glue. I don't know why this one is so excessively dry. What of a nuisance that is. I think that'll do it. There we'll trimmed. That should be. Other than than those uh, things, I really didn't do much. Enjoyed a nice kind of quiet weekend. Saw some friends. Went out for a little bit, so that was quite pleasant. And really spent more or less most of the weekend playing a sandbox computer game called Stormworks. You build boats and airplanes and things like that. I'm a I'm an old old time computer gamer. Ever since I was just a just a little kid, it's always been my thing. And uh, to this day, it, it, it remains my favorite hobby is playing computer games and playing them with my friends. And uh, I find that these sandbox games, especially the the more recent ones, are very very good. And they um, I like playing them because they're cheap and easy creativity. That's oftentimes it's a good way to kind of bleed off some of the excess. And I find myself more centered and focused when I come back after doing that. So people always said, you know, growing up, all oh, video games are gonna, gonna rot your brain, but I, I find them very beneficial to, to my work these days. I, I genuinely do. If you're, if you're of that kind of mindset, I, I recommend looking into some of them. Uh, things like other things like Factorio and more logic-based sandbox games are, are, are also very, very good for this kind of thing. So they're, they're good, they're good brain exercise. I find.
Although, despite all the exercise, I kind of meandering through the stream today. I don't really have any any real great point I'm working towards. Like I said, this thing here, these are fairly simple to do. There's not a lot to show. So I'm just taking my time and taking it easy and enjoying my cup of coffee and this nice fall day. Today, I had to remember as a uh, national holiday, the first time I've ever had this day off, which is kind of fun. My mother and I would always be at work on these days. We could never, uh, never afford to not be open on a Monday. But now I get to enjoy it from the comfort of my own home, which is a real treat. We're going to go ahead, let's see. This is the bottom. Good. Had to identify which was the top and the bottom. Jeff, I find I usually don't need to scuff the backside. Maybe on this one I, I probably should have. But I don't think it was a matter of scuffing. I think it was actually a matter of the glue drying too quickly. I think I think it was actually being absorbed very, very quickly by the flesh side there. And I don't have an answer as to why that happened, but that that I've encountered before on certain calf skins and things like that where you'll get some leathers where the glue will just sit there and stay active for a couple minutes. Other ones where the moment you hit it, it feels like it's just sucked right into the uh, the fibers of it. I don't really know a way to work around that other than, you know, keep adding glue to it, which is, uh, sounds silly, but it, uh, it is, is how, how I get around that. There we go. We've got our, uh, our lines there. And again, this here is just a, uh, a white uh, jelly roll pen, white gel pen. You can see what a nice, very, very clear, crisp line that leaves. Very easy to see. And it wipes off with water. So if you're looking to make some quick and easy marks on your leather without uh, doing anything irreparable, I recommend these. If you watched uh, last week's stream, you saw me do it quite a bit on the glazed alligator. It, it works on just about everything. Very, very good stuff. So now, speaking of scuffing, this is something that does need to be scuffed. We're going to glue finish side to finish side of the chev here. These are all fully lined here, so we have to scuff all the back sides. And we're going to use the uh, Aqualim water base contact glue for this, which means we will have to glue both sides. So, a little bit of prep work and waiting involved here. Turn my heater down a little bit here. Turn that down as low as that'll go. The new heater I've got for the shop, so I'm still kind of learning the ins and outs of it. But so far, I think it's going to be a big improvement over this winter. I had hoped to invest in a, uh, a mini split for the shop this year, but I'm thinking that's going to have to be a next year thing. This year I was more focused on uh, husbanding my dollars, kind of getting through the first transitional year. I think I'll be in a better better position next year to do that, and that'll really be a big improvement to this room. Scuff around the edges there. Let's do these ones. Nothing particularly special or complex about this. Just getting in with the pointy end, scraping it up.
And the more thorough you are with this, the better of a bond you're going to get. It pays dividends to really go in and get all of the area that you plan to put glue on. All scuffed, as much as you can. Pull up as, as much of those interior fibers as you possibly can. Was my godmother. And I do know one. Th I remember now one thing I want to do quickly. On this wallet, at least with this design, it will have a billfold on the outside of it, which means that this bottom section down here has a scallop cut out of it. Now, the last couple times I've put these wallets together, I have forgotten to cut that scallop until after I've already glued these down, which is not a problem but it makes it a little more difficult to do. Now this time I'm going to make a point to try to remember to do that early so that I can get in there, paint it, crease it, and not have to worry about damaging the edges of this. So we're gonna test fit our pieces, make sure everything lines up properly. And then we're going to make some marks here. And then we're going to cut that bottom section out. Will be it's so fine i can barely see it in person and i'm sure you won't be able to on the camera there but i've got two little marks here that show me about how high up i want to go in the fold with the line of those two card slot banks there so i'm going to come in now with my big punch Following the line I just marked. There. We've cut the arch out with that. Follow those two lines we marked. There's the nice scallop cut out so that when we put these in here, see, oh, not there, but <laughs> the line up just like that down at the bottom there, and it just looks rather fetching. We have to dress that now on the creaser, and I'll show you something I came up with um, when I was doing that taupe wallet, the uh, taupe and rose gold wallet, I had to do a lot of paint mixing because I couldn't quite get the same edge color properly. So I had to mix some every time. And I came up with a good way of storing my mixed paint. I have an old token oil jar here. I wrapped up in tape to make sure that no light can get through it. And what I have in here, I mix it in the lid. So you notice that I mixed that yesterday and that's still perfectly liquid there. It needs stirred up a little bit because we got a little bit of uh, you know, pigment separation, but that's to be expected. And on the inside of this, I tuck it up in there. I have a damp paper towel that I put up in the top there. And what that damp paper towel does is it keeps ambient humidity in this jar so that that paint doesn't dry out. And that way I can store it for, you know, a day or two days and have the same mix and not have to worry about remixing it all the time. And I find that works extremely well. Looking at my eyeballing my line here, I think that should... Great. I had to mix up a custom edge color for this because this gray, I don't have any gray edge paint, but I have black and white, so I was able to get a, uh, a perfectly matched edge color for this by mixing uh, the black and white together, obviously. Probably could have worked a drop of blue in there too, but it didn't seem terribly necessary. Taking, we're going to crease the bottom first. Oh. 
See the way the light catches that? How much that dresses that up is a uh, never ceases to amaze me. And for something so small, I'm not really going to worry about stirring that all back up. Take the tip of my finger. Using surface tension, work it in on those edges there. Cover it up. Let that set up. Let that dry. Come back to it. Now, while that's drying, other things we can do that we have to glue the front and back of all these pieces. So while we're waiting for that paint to dry, we'll go ahead and make use of the time and start getting a coat of glue on the back of these uh, pieces here. I'm very excited about the next wall that I have coming up, which is a uh, an ivory Saffiano and white and black ring lizard bifold. It's going to be very, very, very pretty. So that's actually a good question, uh, Jeff. This is actually an example of where I've done something similar to that. That top part slot there is folded. And the bottom one obviously is not because it is, uh, you know, got that scallop on there. So basically on this one here, you know, I fold it where I can, but when I need to, I paint it and I try to get as close of a color mix as possible. In this case, it is so close you cannot tell the difference on it. You don't always get that lucky, you know, depending on the color you've got to match. But in this case, you know, I was able to. There's no, uh... I would never choose to paint if I didn't have to. Because you always save time. At least when it comes to the tops of card slots, you'll always save time by burnishing them rather than painting them. Now, with something with a thicker edge, that's not necessarily the case. In some cases, getting, you know, getting thicker edges and things like that, you may actually be quicker to paint it rather than burnish it, you know, depending. But with card slots, something that's single or double layer or very thin, it's almost a no-brainer. You'll you'll pretty much always choose to burnish if you can. Or if you fold it and not have to do anything, then so much so much the better. So where I was able to fold, I did. Where I had to paint, I did. And I was able to, to pretty much limit that to just one card slot. So not too bad. There we go. So now we'll let that glue set up a little bit. Our paint has dried, our first layer of paint. I'm gonna go in with the filatus, and this is rather awkward on a curve like this, but I do want to still do it. I'm going to go in and melt this paint into the edge here as best I can. And this is always a bit of a fight working around this curve, but I think it's important to do it. Because I do feel very strongly that what really makes edge paint such a good adherent and people talk about edge paint being as good as another coat of glue and I think that's true but I think what really matters with that is uh, this heat application getting that paint really melted and bonded into those fibers I think is, is absolutely critical as I said, it's a little awkward working that tip around in there because of such a, you know, the, the shape of it. But I do have a piece, just some 320 rolled up, and I'm able to kind of work that in there. I'm not trying to really remove much, just kind of working down that edge, taking down any major high spots. And we're going to make up for it with one final thick coat on top of that. Again, same thing. We're just going to go in with our finger. It's 
surface tension do all the work for us. Excess on the back, we just wipe it off. So, shouldn't need any more of this mix, but I'm going to hold on to it anyway because the edges are going to be black. But on the inside, we want to match that color to Chev as much as we can. Let's see if I can show you that. So we're just going to set this aside, let it dry. And our glue has more or less dried on these parts here. Actually, that's what we can do. This is safe to lay down flat. We'll go ahead and we'll start uh, applying glue to the interior here. Time management is very important, you know, learning what you can do while, while certain things are happening. You know, if you're kind of stymied by glue drying, you know, try to find other things that you can do in the meantime to keep your production up. And ultimately, you'll find that uh, even with something relatively simple like wallets or, or even, you know, card wallets, very simple wallets, there's always something you can be doing while you're waiting. There really should not be any time where your hands are actually, truly forced to be idle. You can always find something to do. Being, uh, being efficient matters more to people doing this on a production scale or you're uh, you know, paying the bills from it. But even as hobbyists, you should still be trying to find ways to improve your production capacity, improve your efficiency. In this case, what, I, what I'm going to do while I'm waiting for glue to dry, I'm going to hit the head. So I'm going to put the Be Right Back screen on. We'll, we'll be back in a minute. I'm going to grab a drink of water. And by the time I get back, this glue should be pretty dry. And we should be good to stick these pieces together here. So I'll be back in a minute. All right, and we're back. So as I expected, we're pretty much set here. I'm going to take this. We've got just a little bit of liquid glue left here. I'm going to hold this in front of my heater. Actually, I realize now with this new heater, it, uh, it comes out of the floor. Nice. I like that. Keep my feet warm. 
I have two space heaters in here, and in the winter time when it gets very, very cold, obviously, I heat the uh, room with, with them. But the real advantage of the other one, the one that just kind of has uh, heat rising off the top, you know, with no, with no forced draft, it's great for drying paint. Um, I'm probably going to invest in one of those Mr. Dry booths this year. I was going to build one, and then I realized that the Mr. Dry booths are only like 160 bucks, So I'm just going to get one, I think. But um, it's a common misconception about drying paint that it is uh, all heat-based. That is false. Actually, it's a, it's a mixture. Heat helps. Heat can accelerate the dry. But what actually is doing the, the drying, or the curing, rather, is airflow. You want to get the solvents. Solvents inside paint, they rise to the surface. And stagnant air limits, you know, the, how, how quickly they evaporate, but airflow over the top of it will actually wick away those solvents into the air and cause it to accelerate the cure more. As it, as it pulls up off the top, it draws it up from the bottom, and it, you know, cures very quickly. When painting cars, that's the, always the thing, is that uh, airflow inside the paint booth is the most critical thing. Obviously, number one, for visibility, you know, you don't want to, you want to be able to see you don't want the, the booth filling up with, uh, you know, paint overspray. But more than that, it is actually curing the paint as you're spraying it. So, it, um, it doesn't need to be full blast, uh, just a little bit over top of it. You basically just want to have air flowing over that surface of it. Uh, and warm air is better. So if you're able to have a mixture of, uh, I'll just hold it, I'll hold it upside down over my face heater, either blow with my mouth or just kind of fan my my hand over it, and that's really all it needs to do that. Uh, these aren't especially solvent, uh, super heavy solvent-based paints, so you don't need excessive airflow. Just a little bit is enough. These are solvent-based paints, but you just don't need a, a huge amount of airflow. So these Mr. Dry Booth fans, are, are, or Mr. Dry Booth setups are, are pretty nice. It looks like they've just got a little infrared heater in there, just basically some, some computer fans, which is all you need. You don't need much more than that. So I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to that. That will be a, a big benefit. But if you don't have one or you don't have the room, again, if you have any kind of warm air at all, great. And if you're able just to fan on it or blow it on it a little bit with your with your mouth, that's really all you need. You'll be surprised by how much that helps. One thing I noticed that that helps a lot with, and I'm sure all of you who have edge painted before know about this, the trough. If you have your paint sitting uh, upright, and as it dries, you'll notice you'll get two raised humps and a trough, a depression in the center. And what that is, that solvent remaining active on that very high, the highest peak of it there, as it's kind of drawing up, it sits on the top there and it causes it to sag after a while because it, it, remains, it remains soft compared to the rest of it. If you blow on that or have airflow over it, you'll find that that trough either goes away or is much, much smaller than it would be otherwise. So... If you're not using airflow to your advantage when you're drying paint, you're you're shooting yourself in the foot. Hey, really? Hold on. Really, young man? That is just no. No, you don't. That is just beyond the pale. Look at this big bad boy. He does not want to be held. You're going to have to get locked out. You're being bad. That's Dima. He's my big boy. He's my big friend. He's very food motivated. So he knows that in an hour and 15 minutes, it's time for him to eat lunch. And he, ever the opportunist, always thinks that he can get lunch early. He'll come in and get my attention by batting at my filatus cables that drape over the front of the bench there. So when he starts doing that, I know it's time to lock him out. And then after lunch, he'll come out here and be a perfect little angel. He'll curl up on that heated blanket there and just sit there and purr and be a good cat. But when he's hungry, he's a terror. Our glue is fully dried now, which, is, which means we'll get a really nice clean bond from it. When this aquilum dries clear, you know it's ready to bond, so we're going to go ahead and do that now. I do love using this glue. It's a pain to stitch through. It gets very sticky when you're stitching it. But um, 
it is really nice to just stick something on there and it just sticks it's done that's it you're you're good to go you can hammer it a little bit afterwards which i'm going to do here to really set that bond i always find that a very very pleasing thing to, to just stick that on there and have it uh have it done do the other one now and I'm lining up at the bottom first because what's really important is I want to make sure that this inside edge and this inside edge are perfectly lined up. So I'm starting there. That's my index point. Right. Ah, uh, yes. And just like that, we have almost a wallet. <laughs> and we still got to do a little bit more work here. We're not done yet. Now we've got to do, we've glued on the bottom pocket for that left side there. We still need to glue on the actual ID. That's going to go, that's just going to go over top of that. Nothing, nothing special, nothing crazy. One's on the bottom, one's on the top. Good. Back to, we're back to scraping and gluing again. One first. Woke up today and I was very pleasantly surprised to see that I had, uh, I've sold another one of those harvest wallets. It was nice to uh, make a set of something and actually have it uh, have pretty much the whole set move within a, a week or two. So that was very that was very nice. Thank you to those of you who uh, picked some of those up. And while I'm at it, for those of you who are watching, if you find this entertaining, God help you. But if you do, do uh, please take a second to hit the like button for me. I hate that they make you ask that. They literally tell you, you know, it works better if you ask them to subscribe and to like. And it's like, why? Well, you should. If they if they like that, they should do it anyway. You know, you shouldn't have to be begging. I don't like how uh, they t they deliberately turn you into beggars for this stuff, but way the world we live in, I guess. Old man shouting at clouds. <laughs> I do have something I can show you while I'm waiting for this next set of glue to dry. I, uh, I teased it on one of my Instagram stories last week. I've, uh, I've talked a little bit about it. I, I'm working on, I want to up my photography game a little bit for next year, so I'm working on acquiring some photo props and backdrops and things like that. And one of the ones that I really want to do, I want to have a nice 1960s style desk set up. And I've been uh, kind of hunting for things that fit the bill for that. I haven't found a backdrop yet. I need to go get some veneer. I want to try to find a nice dark Kind of cool toned wood veneer uses my backdrop and have that kind of heavy appearance of a uh, of a desktop and then with all of the uh, the very cool 1960s desk accoutrements I have some I've been slowly acquiring some of them I'm still on the lookout for more but this one that I picked up last week I was very uh, was very smitten by. Set these aside to dry. Oh, this is so cool. So I found this on the world's largest auction, the Electronic Bay. And as you can see, this is the Autodex Starflight List Finder. And it was listed as new in box, pristine condition, and I'll tell you what, they were not kidding. It is just 
perfect. Just perfect. Nice brown with rose gold. Something I've been working a lot with recently. And on the inside, just brand new. It's even got pencil, still sharpened. Never even been used. But what a what a clever system for, for doing that. Just moving a little lever down to what you need. And it just slots into the correct place on the uh on the notepad there. Just just really nice. And just beautiful colors on it. I, I feel like we have uh we have lost something. Now that's a that's a really old man take there. People don't write anymore. Which is ironic for me because being left-handed, I, I despise handwriting. I hate it. I hate it with all, all my being. And my handwriting is dreadful. So I would never I would never sell you this by actually writing in it. But I like the idea that somebody else might. So somebody who actually had nice handwriting, unlike myself. Just uh just nice. And it has a nice weight and density. It feels very dense and solid. Just something that would feel good on on your desk there. Something that's not going to shift around or move. It's metal. Very very little plastic on it. Just uh, just nice. Just nice nice old dumb thing. And now of course you know, all of this is done by uh, by a phone. Much easier and much better than this ever did. But not. I don't know. I just feel like there's something to this. So anyway, it'll make a great photo prop. I'm I'm excited to uh, get the rest of the ensemble put together here. So. Hoping to uh, get that put together in the next couple weeks here and actually start taking some pictures with it. That, of course, will complement my little leather decks very nicely. I guess and we're still waiting a little bit for, for glue. I guess I can show that off one more time. If you missed it the first time. I took this. This was a pocket Rolodex I found. If you look on my Instagram, you can see uh, the restoration of it. But I took it, I stripped all the old paint off. This was all painted. This was painted. I, I stripped all the paint off. Polished would need to be polished. Repainted the back here. And I actually wrapped. This is a plastic body. I took some very, very thin calfskin. And I wrapped this here, the sides of it. And this was, this was where the, uh, the list finder was really didn't apply anymore, so I took that off and I put a foil stamped piece of uh, 1968 dated calfskin there. And when you open it up, it's got all of the, the 16 swatches of Batero that I keep in stock by there. So Someday I'll, I'll get to a point where I'll actually go somewhere and I'll need to show somebody a, uh, a sample sheet, but this year I just saw it and I had to have it. I've never seen anything quite like it before. Never seen a pocket Rolodex quite like this one. So what was funny is when I opened it up the first time, the very first entry it opened up to was listed simply as the jerk with the Chicago area number. So we will forever wonder who the jerk could be. Hope it's not me. <laughs> that really did turn out nice. I'm pleased with that. All right, our glue is finally set up. We can quit nosing about and do this now. Whoops. Shift it a little bit. Oh, no. Oh. Great. Good. Let's set that glue. So there's the whole interior of our wall put together. So you can see now we have our ID window slot beneath it, two card slots, and a slot beneath that on the right side. So there's that, that's a compact little piece, and then there will be a billfold on the outside, too. So this, this little design holds quite a bit. I see our uh, 
I see Espresso's getting a run for its money now. It's neck and neck now, just about. Espresso's just went out with five votes versus four for coffee. All right. I think what we'll do... I'm trying to remember my order of operations here before I go and do anything crazy. Yeah, I think we'll trim this. Then we'll be set to put the billfold on. And actually, when we when we put the billfold on, it's the whole wall that's done at that point. This will be the external billfold there. That looks pretty good. I think we will go ahead and trim this. And before I do that, I'm going to put a new blade in here. Today will be kind of a shorter stream. I think we'll probably only be doing it maybe another half a half hour ish, but that's that's long enough. Hard to believe we've been here an hour already. I try to show new things whenever I can on the stream, but after a certain point, there's only so much that's actually going to be new. So lots of the same old stuff. I need to order some new business cards. I finally ran out. I bought a, a box of 500 of them from Staples from the print shop. And I was actually happy with them. Staples did a great job printing them. I had no complaints. Uh, they lasted me quite a while. But I'm in the uh, the market for something new. So where do you guys get your business cards made? I know Vistaprint is always a solid option. I've had them I've had them done from there for my old for my paint shop. I didn't think they were any better than staples, at least the ones I had ordered. Certainly no no real difference in price or quality. They seemed about equivalent to me. Maybe I was just ordering the wrong kind. I don't know. Before we trim anything, we're going to take our template and lay it over this and see how's everything lined up. How are we looking here? Pretty good. Pretty good here. I think what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to remove as much of the uh, the markers here. And put new lines on this. Move, you say? Really? Okay. I'll take a look at it. When I ship the wallets out, I try to put a business card. Ideally, when I have a bunch of them, I try to put one in each card slot. But in lieu of that, at least a couple inside the billfold somewhere. I expect most of them probably get thrown out, but it's the idea. Principle of the thing. So actually, you can see I wrote that on there yesterday. I've very quickly removed most of it. So even after a full day of sitting on there, you can still remove this marker if you have to. Not terribly worried. If you look closely, you can see a little bit of a shadow of it left. Most of that is going to get trimmed away anyway. I'm not terribly worried about it. I more or less, I just want to put a new line on this. I think this line is good, so I'm going to leave that as it is. It's just when I glued them together, this one ended up being a little bit off. So just to make it easier for myself to see, I'm going to put a new line on there. Here. Moo, I'll take a look. I'll take a look at that. Thank you very much for the recommendation. I'm also again and and going back to what I was talking about with the uh, the photography stuff. I want to get some stationery printed up too you know, from the desk of Dreadnought Leather and looking all nice. Something very again very 1960s styled. Just to kind of have that in the background, I think would be fun. I'll show you, uh, I had these done up. These I use for photography. I don't hand too many of these out. But, uh, these were done for me 
by Steve Gersey's wife from Oak and Honey Leather. Uh, her company is called Cedar and Mint. You can see these are very, very thick, very heavy weight, bone colored, uh, oil stamped business cards. And I very rarely give these out. I only have a few of them. But they were just kind of it's like, ah, hey, you know what? She just opened up her business. I, I want some of these. So a bunch of us, you may have seen all around the same time, had a bunch of foil stamped business cards printed up. These were these were mine. So she just did a, a killer job with that. Just absolutely gorgeous. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. So again, her uh, her company is Cedar and Mint. You can find her on Instagram. I think normally she does wedding stationery and things like that. All right. Oh, pardon me for a second. I need to blow my nose. Uh, the changing of the temperature always gets me. There. Pretty well lined up. There we go. There's our new finalized trim line there. Again, there's no missing that with that white gel pen. Very, very good stuff. I think we'll do the easy ones first. We'll do the straight lines first. Which ruler do I think I'll use this heavier ruler for this? I'm going to do this. I'm just going to let the knife work on its own weight. I'm not going to try to drag it through in one pass. I'm just going to take it and it cuts what it cuts and it takes what it takes. I'm not going to try and force it. There, so there's our first, there's our top edge. Nice and clean. Same for the bottom. Same height on both sides. Everything's good. So we had a nice parallel line there. We've got a little bit of white left showing there. Not to worry. Should have wiped that away. Same thing up here. Our damp paper towel. Wipe that off there. So again, even though for as visible as those lines are, after wiping them down, they just go away. So really excellent stuff. And very inexpensive. You, I got a pack of like six, six or ten of these for like... Eight or nine bucks on Amazon. Very, very good. On this curve here, I'm actually going to take the knife, and then my first couple passes are going to be done against the template. I normally freehand these, but I just don't feel like it today, so. Oh, so there's our curved side there. Another one. There we go. 
There is the overall shape of our mid wall up there. Looking quite smart. While we're at it, why not? We'll go ahead, go ahead and round the corners too. Now it's hard to tell, but I actually do on all my walls. I do a smaller radius at the top than I do at the bottom. It's very, very hard to notice, but it's there. Oh. There we go. Yep, I'm happy with that. That looks that looks nice. We end up with almost exactly the same thickness on both sides, which makes me very happy. That doesn't always work out this way when you have two very different uh, arrangements on each side there. But in this case, it worked out just the way I wanted it to. So that makes me happy. Look very, very nice. Now we need to do the billfold. I have something of a, a decision to make. I have the option of I can either... I don't want to get too much thicker than this. So we're, going to have, we're going to be adding the billfold to it there. So we're going to add another 0.8 millimeter there. And I think that's going to make my decision for me, because I have the option to either try to line this or just burnish the back side of this. And I'm looking at the way this burnishes. I did a test piece here, and the burnished back matches almost perfectly. You can look at that, the, the color of that, and the texture even matches almost exactly the color of the shav on the inside. We don't always get that effect. Uh, if you're doing different color, you know, wildly different colors between the back and the front, that very rarely happens, and you're kind of stuck having to line it and add more thickness to it. I don't want to add more thickness to this than I have to. But I already do have to because I'm adding this billfold to the outside. And I don't really want to skive the outside edges of this because it's going to flex quite a bit on the edges. So I don't want to reduce its strength there. Uh, it's only going to be that one piece there. And it's going to get a lot of heavy use. It's going to take the brunt of the, uh, the abuse from the pocket. So I don't want to reduce its strength. Nor at the same time... Do I want to add a bunch of extra thickness purely for the purpose of having this little section down here look exactly the same? But I think, I, I think I'm going to just burnish it and say that's it, because that looks perfect. That is a perfect color match right there. I mean, you can see right there, that's, that's dead on there. I think that's about as good as that could get versus, let's say, put them actually side by side there. Can't even really tell the difference there. This doesn't seem like adding an extra half a millimeter of thickness would do much, but when you're layering it up, it, it, it does. And I don't really want to make this heftier than it needs to be. We're already kind of nice and slim. I think I'm going to burnish the back of this and leave it at that. And I think that'll work very effectively without adding a lot of extra thickness and bulk to it. Before I go any further with that, I'm going to take a look here and I'm Testing my glue here again, we see a little bit has delaminated there. Before I go on and forget about that, I'm going to address that right now. I don't know why that piece was so dry. Now, of course, the stitches along the top would have held that down, but... I'm going to make sure that we really get it good. We work that glue in there. That's sticking. All right. Let's see. How thick would we actually get if we... 
Now also if I... Now here's another thought. If I did skive and line this, I would then be getting two layers of strength out of it. Hmm. I think I'm going to line it. I think I'm going to skive it and line it. Why not? Let's live a little bit. I think we'll be able to keep the thickness down okay with that. I think we'll be okay. I can skive them both. I'll skive the Chev and the uh, the Batero. Keep that down. That'll be really, that'll feel really good in there. Yeah, we're going to do it that way. We're going to line it. Sometimes you got to talk yourself through it. Let's see here. Get this close to me. Already pretty close. Test fit here to see how that wraps. Take off almost a quarter, just about a quarter inch on that. Still have plenty of room. Try to get these edges as close as I can. So that when I skive it, it's really getting down to the thin edge on the outside there. Yeah, okay. We're going to run this through the skiver here. Let me see, I don't think I have... I didn't uh, set up the skiver camera today, so forgive me. This will only take a second. There we go there. There's our edge all skived. That. Let's cut a piece of shove for the liner there. We really, we're going to say we don't have... This is all I've got left this. I might as well use it up. You know, what the hell. What else am I going to do with a, a piece of shove this size, you know? All right. Now I need to take this to the Skyver too. I'll be right back. Actually, I think I'm going to take a minute and set up the Skyver camera just because I have to. I've got to sharpen the blade on the bell skiver. I'm not getting a super great cut on this, which means it's time to sharpen it. I might as well set it up so you guys can see it, since I'll be over there for a minute doing that. And bell skiver content people seem to like, so. These, uh, these machines have a, a sort of a mysticism to them. I think it's uh, undeserved. They're fantastic machines, but they are really more simple than people seem to uh, think they are. Plug the camera in, hold the tight. Let's see if it worked. Hang on. Oh, hang on. There. Windows is detecting the camera. Aha, there we go. Whoop, wait a minute, that's not right. That's wrong. That's also wrong. Why 
What have I done here? <laughs> what have I done? Really now? Okay, I don't know why that took so long. <laughs> there we go. All right. I'm going to sharpen the bell sky for a little bit. Get some scrap first. The most valuable commodity to have when you're working on a bell skyver is actually scrap. You always got to test something. You want to make sure that you're not about to eat your good leather, so you want to test it on scrap first. Get here and clean the, the bell out a little bit. Mine tends to accumulate shavings quite easily. I'm sure I could resolve that with enough time and attention, but I just don't feel like it. So I'm getting in here and I'm reaching in here and I can feel the blade is actually, I can touch the edge of the blade and it doesn't frighten me. So that means it needs to be sharpened. I'm just taking my magic marker, marking the edge of the blade. I know where the, where the sharpener is, but still it pays to be sure. So know that when, my, when I see that marker being removed, I know where I'm sharpening the blade at. I'm going to turn the, turn the speed up to max. And I already have the sharpening stone engaged, so it's spinning as I go, and I'm going to, I'm going to use this to walk it onto the blade kind of slowly, but I'm going to go deep. I'm going to, I'm going to make an aggressive cut on this. Right, let's do it. Did you hear towards the end there how it got quieter and quieter? That was me slowly walking the grinding stone off of the wheel. That looks pretty good. Now, here, this will be the test. Let's see if it actually cuts this shaft. Oh, mama, look at that. Let me bring that over to the main camera. Uh, it might be a little hard to catch here. No, you can see it pretty plain as day, so look at that. So this is already half a millimeter thick goat skin, so it's kind of soft and it's very thin. We're getting a perfect, nice, clean, down almost to a feather. That's got to be down to 0 0.2, 0 0.3 millimeters thick. That's pretty good. There are a lot of people who say you need you need an extra servo motor or you need to do this and that to be able to do that consistently. That's false. That certainly helps. That's good. Make no mistake. If you're gonna if you're gonna do that, by all means, it certainly makes it easier. But it is not a requirement to be able to do this. The biggest thing is learning to sharpen that blade, and it's actually pretty simple. Uh, turn turn motor up, walk wheel on, walk wheel off, and then go. That's that's basically it. But being attentive to when you need to do that and understanding that you need to do that frequently is important. Um, having your sharpening stone positioned properly to engage the blade in the right way to actually sharpen it is, is also very important. If you look, if you have watched my other streams, you'll have heard me talk about adjusting that. I think maybe I'll, maybe in the next stream I do, maybe I'll, I'll take the thing apart and show that because th th that's the, the biggest thing you can do. So we can see the difference here between I, I did nothing 
no change to the bell skyver other than sharpening the blade and you can see here's the first time i tried to go through and you can see it bit a little bit but right after that it just kind of skated over the top of it and all it did was rough that up a little bit versus this one where it cut cleanly through it the whole length of it so that's the importance of doing that we're going to run this back through try to clean this edge up a little bit now So there we go, beautiful. The other side, along the bottom, that I want along the top. This is how it Beautiful. Again, there we go. You can see we've done three out of the four edges there. And you notice how it's starting to, we're getting a little bit of a roughness there. That means it's starting to, you know, it, it's, it will need to be touched up a little bit. It doesn't take much to do that. And um, when you're, it requires a very sharp blade to be able to do this. And a very sharp blade becoming merely a sharp or sharpish blade is enough to make a difference on that. So you have to, uh, you have to keep it topped up. I think that's good enough. I think we've saved ourselves some thickness there. I think that will be passable. Yeah, I'm okay with that. that that's not an excessive addition of thickness there. And once it's stitched down, that'll be good. We'll put our two layers together there, and we're, we're about as thick as we would have been otherwise with just a single layer. So I'm, I'm happy with that. I'm going to call that a success. We're done with the bell skyver now, so I'm going to turn that camera off. I don't know what it is about that mobile camera, but it gets it gets warm just sitting there. I don't know. I don't know what the deal is with it. I'm going to stick this guy somewhere safe because I'm about to do some gluing. Two over here, out of the way. I'm going to do for this what I did uh, for that inside part. Okay, so I'm just going to glue this flat to it. I will glue it on a curve, but I'm not going to worry about doing uh, any edge gluing or things like that. It's just going to be very straightforward. Glue the whole surface and go. Instead of gluing to the Batero, I'm going to glue to the Chev this time. Because I think it is going to... I don't think the Chev is quite as dry as these pieces of Batero. I think I'll get a little bit more working time out of it doing it this way. Let's see, see if I'm right. Got a lot of surface to cover, so we're putting a lot of glue down, trying to spread it very quickly, and not trying to spread it too terribly thin, because the thinner we go, then we're going to run into just, you know, evaporation from ambient air. So we don't want to leave it a whole slurry on there, but we also don't want to get it so thin that it just dries up. Close to the edge there, as close as we can. I think if I could change one thing about myself, I wish I was a less messy gluer. And I could be if I tried, but I just, I don't know. Old dogs and new tricks, all that stuff. Okay, we're going to do the same thing here. Pin that on there. Pick it up. It ended up getting glued slightly askew, but it's not going to matter because we're going to trim this down to size. Taking my thumb and working that out to the edge, working from the middle towards the out, the outer edge. That should do. Actually, I think we got a pretty good, 
pretty good glue there. I don't think that's going to matter as much, but just to be safe, I'm going to work some more glue in there. I think that's all going to get trimmed away. But in the event that it doesn't, I'm going to make sure that there's glue there. Now, by doing this, this, of course, will mean also I'll need to, rather than simply burnishing the edge of this, I'll have to paint it, but... I think this was the right choice. Good. Okay. This will be the out the outside billfold that wraps around the outside of the wallet there once we trim it to size. I think I'm going to I'm going to mark this from the inside out. I'm going to trim away any excess chevre just so I can get a clear picture of the actual dimensions of this. tracing it from the inside rather than from the outside. Because that way, if I do have any white lines left over, it's not going to be as stark against the gray as it would be against, you know, the black. Still pretty stark, but it'll also be glued up against the inside, so it'll effectively be completely obscured by that. Clean up some mess here. Do a quick... Test fit here. Hmm. I know what I have to do real quick. I'm going to punch some holes real quick. We're not going to stitch just yet. I'll show you why in a second. That's all I need to do. Why did I do that? I want to make sure that when I glue this billfold to this piece here, I don't have any weird stitch lines that I need to worry about jumping. I'm going to check and see the alignment of it here. And actually, I'd, <laughs> I need to come up a little bit higher. Punch a little bit low. That. There we go. So you know one thing I talk about when I'm talking about doing uh, punching your stitch holes, I don't like stitch holes that pierce the top edges of things. So I'm looking at this to make sure that when I actually align this, I'm going to be doing so in a way that lets me bridge that very cleanly. And that's when I made this pattern, I was it was a while ago, I made this going on almost three years now. 
there were some parts of it that I was very careful about and some parts I was less careful about. And unfortunately, one of them was the height of this piece here. So I remember from making so many of these, this piece needs to actually be a little bit longer than I have my template made out to be. And I just haven't got around to having a new one cut yet. So I just kind of, I, I bit it by hand every time, which you, you lose a bit of time doing that, but it's, it's worth it. Eventually I'll remember to have a new, a new template made up for it. But until then, I'm doing it this way. Remember that I want to be actually This is the line of my template. This is the actual line I want to follow. Take this and mark a new line for that. I know I want to come down about, about a millimeter. About a millimeter higher than I would have been otherwise. There. All right. Go ahead and get this trimmed up. So we're going to start with the top edge first. Nice clean edge there. Test that edge. No delamination. We got a nice glue bond there. And we can see the transition. Having skived both pieces of this, we can see the nice transition to that feather edge on the outside edge versus the nice thick edge in the center. And we want this to be thick in the center because this is, again, this is going to take the brunt of, you know, the abuse from the pocket. You want this to have some degree of heft to it. It should not be dainty. It should be elegant, but it should not be dainty. Here we're going to go... There. Now, doing that by hand, you may think that you get a little bit of a rough cut. You know, if you look right there, you can see it's kind of a harsh angle there. Not to worry, it'll sand down, and then again, when we crease it, that will also get further rounded and smoothed by that. Off edge, make sure there's no bite there. Fire up the old creasing iron here. Let's test fit and make sure that it's all works. Yep. Make sure that that scallop matches exactly right on the center there. It does. And one other thing to note, too, if you're designing one of these, if you design, if you do this external billfold and you design it so that your billfold is tucked up right up against that, exactly like that, it will not work. It will not hold bills. You need to have it more like this. See that gap there? That gap is critical. And you wouldn't think that bills would be so thick to where just a piece of paper won't wrap around that corner there, but it absolutely will not. So if you design this and your billfold is flush on the outside of the spine there, it's not going to close. It's going gonna, it's gonna to give somewhere. You'll feel it bend somewhere on the inside. So leave a little bit of space in there for those bills to fit. Double check our line here. That all looks proper. It does that. Go ahead and trim the bottom. Before I do that, I'm just going to take a quick measurement, real quick, just to make sure I have it the same on each side. Three and nine sixteenths. Three and nine sixteenths. Perfect. There. Clean all the rest of this off. I really do need to get that template remade. But not today. Some other day. 
the outside piece is much longer than the inside piece by about if i remember right it's about three eighths to half an inch longer than the outside you'll be able to see here yeah it looks like about three eighths of an inch you can see here here's the edges of these that's how much longer I have that. And the bill, the bifolds are the same. Those are closer to three eighths of an inch. But uh, yeah, that extra space, that easement, as I call it, is critical to these to these actually working and fitting together. Looking good. Looking good. Should be able to crease this now. Crease the bottom because I've cut that to size. I know that's going to fit where that needs to be, so it'll be easier to do that now while it's off of the wallet. Let's come back, do the outside. You can see our crease rounds that off pretty nicely. Looks good. Looking good. All right. I think I'm going to wrap it up here in the next couple minutes. I'm going to give it a, a five or ten minutes to. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. But uh, there's not really a whole lot else to show here. I think I'm just going to kind of get down to it. I've got some edge painting to do. Nothing particularly thrilling. So. I'd say we'll give it another 5-10 minutes here. If you have any questions, I'd say now would be the time to ask them. Uh, otherwise, I certainly do thank you for joining me today. Not a particularly thrilling stream, but just, you know, that's what it is. The job is getting the work done, so. They can't all be full alligator. That is still going to be very nice. Yeah, that's gonna look that's gonna look nice and smart. I like that quite a bit. So again, any questions? We're gonna wrap it up here in a few minutes. Any questions at all, feel free to drop in the chat. I'm always happy to answer them. As I always say, I, I do this stream more for my own benefit than, than anybody else's, but I, I do enjoy getting to teach people. So if there's something that uh I've done here that you you're unfamiliar with or unclear of. I'm happy to explain it for you. Or if you have any questions about anything, I'm always, always my pleasure. Well, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it, Sokmi. It's kind of, just one of those days, you know, just nose to the bench, doing the work. Yeah, that's good. Now this edge, being on the outside, this is not going to be the same gray. This will just be straight black. Really nice. Yeah. Add another rack for my paint there. Starting to run out of space. We can just use the mesh roller for this one. First layer doesn't matter, really just getting coverage on there. I think we'll we'll show some heat spreading. Paint. That'll be the end of the stream, I think.
dry up. It doesn't need to get too, too dry. Just dry enough to where we can hit it with the heat spreading iron, and that'll be that. some airflow on it and because I have not put a lot of paint on here you can actually visibly see it losing the sheen as the, as the solvents come out of it and it starts to tack up not that'll really come through on the camera but I can see it so Realize as well, once I do this, I need to put my maker's mark on there somewhere down on that corner. I'm going to turn my heater back on, put it next to the pan there, let it get some coarse uh, draft heat over the top of it. Stir it right up. That's how you know you start to got too too much here. I can't exactly remember where I put things. I have two beautiful ring lizard hides that are going to be used up next. And I know they're somewhere up there I would show you, but I just don't remember exactly where they are. <laughs> There we go. Perfect. That should a number on it. We're ready to go ahead and spread that. Hi, Mike. Uh, unfortunately, we're just about to wrap it up here. So, uh, as I uh, basically as I spread this out here, we're gonna we're gonna call it a day here. But we'll review what we did. So I've got the filatus. This is a zipper cutting tip, and it's uh, it's quite hot. Very hot. It'll burn you. I'm going over it on the flat first. Spread it. And you notice when it spreads, it'll kind of build up and overlap the edges. I go back on the 45s to work that back in towards the center. And it's kind of the game you're playing when you're spreading this. You're kind of spreading it down flat, and it'll come out, work over the edges, and you've got to roll it back up into the edge and kind of dome it and shape it. Takes a delicate touch to get down there in that little trough. You'll never get it perfectly smooth, but again, you go in with sandpaper afterwards and work it down. So that's a, an edge that's been properly melted in, smoothed, ready for a quick sanding, and then another thicker, kind of visible finish layer put over top of that. So I think that's going to be it for the day. I think we've, I think we've got all the questions we're going to get, so I think we're going to call it here. Uh, again, if you, if you haven't yet, do please hit the like button on this video. I, they say it helps, so sure. <laughs> I believe them, I suppose. But keep an eye on my Instagram. I'll be sure to post pictures of this one when it's all done. And, uh, we'll look for you next week. If you have suggestions or about things you'd like to see or questions about things I did, please do you know reach out to me on uh, Instagram or via email. I'm happy to happy to take those questions. And uh, again, always open to suggestions for things you'd like to see. I'm I'm 
tempted to do some Skyver maintenance. Maybe that'll be what we do next. Seems to always be a, an interesting topic for people, so maybe that'll be the next session, but I don't know. We'll, we'll see come Monday. So until then, have a good week. Uh, hope to see you guys next week, and take care.